American hegemony is back, if only temporarily, for the defense of Europe. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today we're going to be talking to an old friend of the Federal Trust, Professor Richard Rose of Strathclyde University and uh, the University, the European Institute in Florence uh, and uh, holds an appointment in Berlin as well. He's uh, an expert on the topics we're going to be discussing today, which is um, the position of post-Brexit Britain um, after the Ukraine war. And um, Professor Rose has written extensively about America, Russia, European Union defense issues. Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I don't think anyone would deny that um, the past four or five months uh, have seen important changes in the geopolitics of, of Europe and the world. Um, how would you sum up these changes and particularly, we'll talk about later, uh, the implications of these changes for post-Brexit Britain? Well, the starting point is that military force is now the priority. It defines security that way rather than defense against terrorism. Um, secondly, Europe now extends to the Black Sea and the River Don, and the defense of Europe extends to Washington, which is the chief player in NATO. In terms of the resolution or the truce or the armistice of the war in Ukraine, the key players are Biden, Zelensky, and Putin. Uh, none of them are current or ex-members of the European Union. So where Britain fits in, interestingly, it's a founder member of NATO, it's trusted by the United States. I'm speaking of the British government in the sense of the British Army, the Royal Navy, uh, the MI5, MI6. We saw in the forthcoming war in Ukraine that uh, the British government with Boris Johnson as its spokesperson, with the Prime Minister as its spokesperson, was following the line that proved right, briefing that Putin was going to go to war and it was unjustified. Whereas, and, was, and the prime minister has been quick to bond with Kiev and the guarantee to Sweden and Finland as to who would defend them if in the interim before they could get into NATO, Johnson's trip there for one day was sending a message to Moscow that Britain would go in if the monkey business was tried in Finland or Sweden, and the US would therefore go in after it. That wasn't an accident. That was the most significant thing I've seen. You made the point that military force is now the immediate priority. Uh, isn't there a danger of seeing that as, as being the only track? Um, aren't economic sanctions very important? Isn't political pressure important as well? And the European Union has had a, an important part to play in the economic sanctions against uh, Russia. Now, do you discount that uh, entirely? Or, or, or do you think that, that there are twin tracks to be pursued? These are twin tracks. The tempo is different, the means are different. Uh, the fact is, and I, that was my view since it started, was that the German policy of change through trade, Handel, uh, uh, Dirk Handel, has collapsed. Nord Stream 2, which cut Ukraine out in order to make Germany more dependent on Russia will be unwound at a slower tempo, tempo than the war in Ukraine. And this point will be noticed by people who want to prepare for a need to move fast. And that means military and building up forces. Um, the French and the German policy 
immediately prior to the war, I can explain it, but it turns out to be unsuited for what Moscow is preparing. The East European countries who have enormous, I've done research across the Baltics, and I know Poland, and in fact, the, uh, the Russian view is that military force is important. And um, they prioritize NATO. Given a phone call from Joseph Borrell and uh, Washington, they put EU on hold, Brussels on hold, and talk to Washington. That's but the that yeah, That's but, the immediate here and now priority. Well, I was going to say um, uh, that it may well be their immediate here and now priority, um, but the Poles, um, uh, the, the Slovenians, uh, the Croatians um, do see their future as being very much bound up with the European Union, as do the Ukrainians. If anything, the Ukrainians are more eager in the long term to be members of the European Union than to be members of NATO. So I, I think I'm saying, Brendan, is disagreeing with the importance of the EU um, and, the, uh, uh, and the idea of further enlargement into the Balkans. I know Vienna and I know their priorities, but it just doesn't address the parallel point, which um, has been neglected since the 80s, since 1975, continued expansion of the welfare state has been financed by the reduction in the military budget. And you've had plenty of British retired generals and admirals writing letters to the Times, pointing out that it's been squeezed too far in Britain. But the time has come to rebuild it for a new danger, which is not uh, the economic theories of, of uh, the need to do this, the need to do that, fight inflation. Uh, they haven't gone away, the importance of the ECB and all that. It's just that um, the opportunity is that Britain, having left the EU for the next two years, the rebuilding of military defense of North Atlantic Europe will be important, like the period from 47 to 49, when Britain, the Attlee government, invited uh, the US to take over and guarantee Greece and Turkey, and then the foundation of NATO. The US needs a European partner, and but, but, it will work through NATO, what I call Brussels or Mons, in the afternoon under but, but, the Biden but, but, presidency. But the German government in particular seems to be very seized of this need to build up um, military capacity. Um, yes, but it well, won't happen until until the late, the later on in this decade. It's not there now. The Estonians can't can't ring Berlin for help, and they have a NATO base in Estonia. Yes, that's what the thousand British troops are doing in the Baltic. Yes, where do you think, in general, Britain fits immediately in the short term into yeah. this um, this new world? Well, it's found a, uh, it's found a real, there's a real opportunity, which uh, Downing Street, somebody in Downing Street is aware of it and can offer it to Johnson in terms of photo ops, but it goes far beyond photo ops. The real opportunity is to be a hinge between the big military powers of um, Europe, or potential military powers, which are France and Germany, and um, Washington, because Washington can deal directly with Kiev and with Warsaw, but it's, uh, it, it wants 
it wants to keep NATO going. It's a chance for NATO. Uh, the present prime minister is uh, doing a job, that job well. It's an offset for the mess in Northern Ireland, which doesn't go down well in Washington either. Uh, if you look at Military Services Committee in Congress, they would take a different view of, of Britain's capacity than Boston congressmen. It will take a new prime minister to give a political lead to a strategy of Britain as a hinge. But after all, there's speculation that after two by-elections later this month, there will be a new prime minister. Before we come on to that, can you uh, tell me why uh, the Americans or indeed the French and Germans would see a role as a hinge for the United Kingdom? Why can't, particularly as uh, military preparedness in Germany increases, why can't the United States deal directly with Germany and with France, who may well, we'll be talking about this later, um, be working in a more co co coordinated and coherent fashion in future within the European Union? Oh, well, for two reasons. They're not doing it now. Secondly, you're quite right that uh, France and Germany will um, want to look after their national interest. But Berlin's national interest, until it gets its military force up and until Brussels has a command strategy, which does not give any member state a veto of going to war, I mean, there is no common national interest definition between the major players, including Poland and Spain and everybody else, uh, on what should be done in 48 hours. Uh, Britain has sometimes got it right, sometimes got it wrong in the past. <laughs> I don't doubt that. But um, the idea, the European Council, which will be the appropriate place to start to take the decisions. Um, it's not a military command post built for fast actions. Differences in national interests. Washington has got more housemarked negotiating bilaterally. But <laughs> in fact, American hegemony is back, if only temporarily, for the defense of Europe. Yeah. Um the French view of um, uh, future defence integration in Europe doesn't seem to be uh, that of uh, all member states of the European Union equally participating. It seems to be coalitions of the willing. Um, do you exclude entirely the possibility that over the next five years, um, a coalition of the willing might be found uh, between France, Germany, Italy, Spain, possibly the Benelux countries, um, it doesn't necessarily have to include everybody. Uh, and there would be the possibilities, it seems to me, uh, of formidable um, gatherings together of forces from the countries that, that I've just mentioned. Um, I would uh, accept this at the level of a memorandum of understanding. But currently, if you're going to put a multinational brigade or a multinational division into the field, the command language will be American English. And they'll have to be able to move very fast. It's, and they will have to have a political structure on top of them, which could be, God knows, could be, it could be in the Netherlands. Well, but, perhaps they will be speaking English English in the Netherlands. I, but the language of command will be yeah. American English. Yeah. Um, be that, interesting that, to see. The move would be written in English English, but you drop the U's out in the press release and what. Yeah. Um, do you see in some of the discussion in the United Kingdom uh, about the way in which supposedly 
Britain has now an enhanced role in Europe because of the Ukraine um, war. Um, the desire of, of certain advocates of Brexit um, to find uh, benefits of Brexit, to prove that there are benefits of Brexit, which have been pretty thin on the ground. And if that is so, is there a danger, not a danger of uh, overstating the case? I, I can see that the, the United Kingdom's position in Europe tragically and ironically has been helped by the, by the break, outbreak of the war in Ukraine. Um, but this shouldn't be overstated, should it? It's um, not something that can uh, compensate for being outside another very important forum of, of world decision-making, which is the European Union. I would agree with you on that, Brendan. I think the, um, what we've got really are different vectors which are independent. It was a, let's face it, that the coal and steel community, the failure of Monet's original plan to have a Europe with a defense arm, a European defense community, and a European economic community, that is the goal. But in fact, instead of being two wings of a united Europe, uh, the defense community failed in 54, and the Treaty of Rome, the economic community, has advanced. It won't deal with Britain's economic issue. The question is, uh, what would the position be in future after the next British general election? Putting on my sophologist hat, uh, it's Unlike, most unlikely, that the Conservatives would win a majority, and it's very likely that they couldn't govern in a coalition or as a minority government. So a Labour government, which is the most likely thing, whether on its own or with the support of the Lib Dems or the SNP, would have to have an economic policy a, uh, which uh, is important to deal with the compound effects of Brexit, COVID, and global and cost inflation. They would also have to have a military policy. But I think that, uh, and this is not Starmer's thing, it's not a popular post to have Minister of Defense. And in fact, foreign secretary in a labor government would have to take orders from Downing Street because the big decisions are political strategic on economics strategy. That, those are very big uncertainties. An interesting straw in the wind. The Times this morning published a Scottish poll and showed that there was a big majority of Scots, including keeping nuclear weapons at Fast Lane, five miles down the road from my house. Now, the Fast Lane base in Scotland is an important nuclear or European nuclear contribution to Washington, to NATO defense. That's uncertain too, but it's the fact that the Scots, I think 8% of Scots in the poll were against it and they were undecided, but it shows the sort of role that is significant and awareness of opportunities in difficult times because to continue, uh, the next non-Johnson government, well, the next Tory, the prime minister, the Tories will have problem, prime ministers, problems up till December, 2024, and who's ever prime minister afterwards was. This is one thing where there's a positive contribution, which is realistic. You talked about- no shortage of unrealisms. The, you talked about, um, final question, you talked about the uncertainty of um, where Starmer might stand on these issues. 
despite the opportunity that you see. Um, uh, how will that be affected by the identity of the of the president? Um, if the president were the American president were Trump or or Trumpite uh, apostle, um, how would that uh, interplay with all these things that we've been discussing? Uh, in in particular. Um, may not the, the fear of a, a Trumpite resurgence um, be a, an incentive for the Germans and French um, to be much more uh, integrated in their military planning than we've ever seen them before? Um, interest, well, uh, first of all, let's consider this as a contingency plan because nobody, including myself, knows who will be president of the United States the day before the election. Biden's health is not good. The 25th Amendment makes provisions. Kamala, the vice president, is not competent uh, to do foreign policy. At least Biden's been around for a long time. The key point is that Burns at the CIA have been is making the policy, and Biden is presenting it intelligently. If Trump came in, all the people in the Pentagon and the CIA might start looking for their EU citizenship and thinking of emigrating. On the other hand, um, contingency planning can go forward. It can even go forward not in the terms of preparing for a Trump presidency, but to favor continued NATO cooperation with the proviso tucked away in fine print, that of course, if Washington doesn't want to play ball, we can just, you know, we've got a choice. At the moment, the EU doesn't have a choice. And Britain is not bound not to have a choice. Britain has a choice, the EU doesn't. The EU should be getting ready to work with the next president of the United States. And that that is not an easy sell because the standing of the EU in Washington in terms of the ambassador is not as high as the German ambassador or the British ambassador. The British ambassador's job is to get his phone calls returned before um, the phone calls of, uh, from Brussels. Just that simple. It goes on that in 1954, the European defense community um, fell apart, didn't, didn't work. Um, and there's a temptation, of course, to say that the same may happen today. But I prefer the Henry James view of history, which is that the future will resemble the past, except to the extent that it differs. And I think there's every chance um, we'll, we'll hope, we hope we'll be able to discuss it again in a few years' time, um, that this time the Europeans will make a, a better job of, of, of giving themselves um, coherence um, in, uh, in, in military issues. But thank you very much indeed. I think we've covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure uh, anybody who's been listening has learned a great deal from your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.